Hi. On February 23rd, we launched public tests for Mentor 2. We also posted an article with the key changes and new features. And in this video today, I'm going to tell you about all the major aspects, peculiarities, and transaction structures that will help you while testing. First, liquidity pools. In addition to old banker methods of exchanging the coins, we're now introducing liquidity pools similar to Uniswap. Second, creation of tokens or coins with no reserve. Third, validator fee change. We've enabled validators to make changes to the fee they charge to their delegators. Earlier, the fee was set when launching the node and couldn't be modified afterwards. The only thing validators could do was give cash back as a bonus. Fourth, all validators will now vote on the network-wide fees. I'll talk about this in more detail when we come to this specific topic a bit later. And seamless updates of the network. It means that from now on, we won't have to stop the network, export the Genesis file, undergo an update, import the Genesis file back, and so on. The whole process will be as smooth as possible. Let's start with liquidity pools. Those who don't know what the Uniswap exchange logic is, you can read their uh, white paper. In Minter, our logic is a bit different from theirs, which is a smaller percentage on the exchanges inside the pool. First things first, step one is creating a pool. Here we specify two coins that we want to create this pool for and the volumes of these coins that we want to add into it, making them liquid against each other. The bigger the pool, the more liquid they are. If the pool's volumes are small, then with each small exchange, their price will change greatly. So you need to have these amounts in your wallet because once the pool is created, they'll be withdrawn and locked into the pool. Later, you'll be able to remove them, but let's stop here for now. For adding the coins into a liquidity pool and actually creating it, your accrued PL or pool liquidity tokens. The number of these tokens to be accrued upon creation is calculated using the formula you can see here. 1,000 Satoshi units of these tokens will be locked on the zeroth address. This is done to protect the users of the pools. If you want to find out more, just pause the video here and read this slide. Let's talk about adding to the liquidity pool. After the pool has been created, you can only add to it, and you can do so only at the ratio that matches the current volumes of coins in the pool. Accordingly, the only new field here is the maximum volume one. As for the volume zero field, the blockchain uses it to calculate how much of the second coin we should add. That way, the value you've transmitted in maximum limits the blockchain so that it doesn't withdraw more coins than you want. For example, if a large exchange of coins took place inside the pool and the proportions shifted as a result, you would be charged a lot. This is done to keep your funds safe. When you add coins to the liquidity pool, the number of PL tokens is calculated using the formula you can see here. Besides these values, namely uh, volume one and liquidity, will be repeated in the transactions tags. Next is removal of coins from a liquidity pool. Here we also transmit a pair of coins and how much liquidity we want to remove. Reminder, the amount of liquidity is equal to the number of PL tokens of a given pool that is in your wallet. If you've sold, transferred, or locked them somewhere else, and you can do that too, you won't be able to withdraw your share from a liquidity pool. In this transaction, we also specify the 
minimum numbers of coins zero and one that we want to get back from the pool. Because when you make a uh, withdrawal, you're expecting a certain number of both coins to return, while there may be some last minute exchange causing the rate to change significantly and leaving you with the volumes you've not expected. After you notice it, it's too late because the liquidity pool has balanced back and the whole thing turned out not how you thought it would. Let me remind you that it's not possible to leave the liquidity pool empty as 1,000 Satoshi units are forever locked on the zeroth address for each pool. And the transactions tags will return volumes zero and one showing how many coins you got back on your balance after sending a removal transaction. Next comes the exchange transaction. Its structure doesn't differ much from that of Bancor we have now, meaning we still have the sell, sell all, buy, and other types of transactions. Well, and others, that'd be all of them. The only thing is we transmit coins as an array, always starting with the one we're selling and up to the one we're buying. Because our liquidity pools support routes, we can make several exchanges in a single block, eventually transforming one coin into the other. For example, we have coin one and one to get coin five, but there is no direct liquidity pool between them. That's why exchange transactions will happen among those very coins that you put in this array. Or say the coins can be swapped directly through an existing pool because of low liquidity, but there is enough of it in pools with other coins. In this case, it's only logical to use a workaround. Therefore, the network fees are calculated using the formula you can see on your screen. Reminder, we're now voting on the fees, so I can't specify their numerical values. But the logic is very similar to multi-cent transfers. There is also a base amount that will be withdrawn from you when you exchange one coin for another. And in case it's a route, you'll get charged some more. On testnet, there is a 10 bip fee per exchange and 5 bip per each exchange within the route. For example, if a transaction contains coins 1, 2, and 3, you'll spend a total of 15 bip. Let's now go over other transactions. I think you're already familiar with them, so we won't spend much time here. And one more thing, uh, the fees that are charged by liquidity providers. With each swap via liquidity pool, 0.2% in the coin sold is locked into the pool. In Uniswap, this number is 0.3, so be careful when making calculations. Remember that ours is a uh, bit different, it's slower and actually more profitable. The route can contain five coins at most. If there are five coins, like I said, then it will be uh, first to second, second to third, third to fourth, and fourth to fifth. A total of five, of four iterations. And with each of them, 0.8% of the coin will stay in the pool. Minter has always positioned itself as a network where it is possible to pay fees in any of the custom coins issued on it. And with Bancor coins, everyone already knows how it works and is used to it. With uh, liquidity pools, it'll also be possible to do that provided there is a uh, direct payer with BIP. So if you want the holders of your custom coin to be able to pay fees in it, make sure to create a liquidity pool with the base coin of the network. The transaction will include the quantity of the base coin that you've spent, 
along with the amount of the custom coin charged in order to pay the fee. And the uh, exchange method, you can now swap custom coins for a fee that will be calculated using either of the two methods, Bancor or Uniswap. The blockchain will independently choose the most efficient way to exchange the coins and inform you which one was in the corresponding tag. We've also added new API endpoints for this particular purpose. A swap pool lets you check the pool state in relation to a given pair. Just enter coins 0 and 1 and you'll see their amounts locked into it, plus the total liquidity for that pool. You can also view the amount of liquidity supplied by a given provider and their current share. There is also now support for estimating exchange operations using our old methods as well. The swap from flag appeared, which shows the method you want to use for estimation. If you transmit optimal, the most efficient rate will be used. The response will say which one was, Bancor or via pool. Here you can also specify the route or chain of coins that you want to use if swapping through a liquidity pool. Tokens. As I've already mentioned, tokens are coins that are not backed. Transactions of creating and recreating them are not much different from a regular coins creation transaction. The field's reserve has been rendered unnecessary, while there are two new ones, mintable and burnable. The coins that were issued using the uh, old banker method earlier can be easily recreated through a uh, recreate coin transaction. The same is true for create token, which you can later turn into a new coin with reserve by sending a uh, recreate coin transaction. Not a prop. The mint transaction lets you mint more coins. Here we transmit the coin that we'd like to additionally issue and the number of new coins to be created. These coins will appear on the owner's address and accordingly only the owner can send such a transaction. The burn transaction will destroy coins from the address of anyone who sent it. The only requirement is that they have enough amount in their wallet. And of course, for this to be possible, the burnable box has to be ticked when creating. The validator fee changed now. It's easy too, uh, we just transmit the public key of the validator and the new value for the fee we want to set. There are some restrictions, it can only be done from a validator owner address. Besides, the fee can be changed once every three months if expressing this time frame in months, or to be more precise, three unbound periods. On testnet, we made unbound periods shorter. We lowered them to 177 blocks, which translates to 15 minutes, meaning three unbound periods will take 45 minutes. So on testnet, validators can update their fees once every 45 minutes. Another limitation to protect delegators is that the fee can be changed by a maximum of 10 units. If you were charging 10%, you can switch to 20% maximum and 0% minimum. If 50, then 60 and 40 respectively. I think it's all clear. Next time in three months, you can increase or decrease by 10 units again. The next feature is voting on fees. Validators can now vote on all network fees. 
In this transaction, validators transmit their public key, the height at which they want to see the fee updated, uh, and uh, and the coin in which they want this fee to be expressed. And also the rest of the fields that display the cost of a given transaction and participate in its calculation. The change of these costs is proceeded with once a two-thirds majority of the network's total voting power has cast its votes in favor. It means they all need to vote for the same height, for the same coin, and input the same transaction cost data. Uh, so how does it work? How does this feature work when we specify a coin other than BIP? It is mandatory that the coin have a liquidity pool with BIP. So if we choose a uh, USD stablecoin, for example, we know how much the fee is in the US dollar. Assume the transfer costs one cent. Thus, we'll need to calculate how much BIP we'd need to spend in order to buy the one cent. But in fact, there will be no purchase as such. There will just be a, a calculation of worth. That way, we'll find out how many BIPs we'd need to spend and convert the necessary amount of a custom coin into that number of BIPs, charging it from the balance and sending into the validator's fee. Once the consensus is reached, there will be a fee update event. It will contain the coin along with all other fields that the validators have voted for. Apart from a charge in the base coin, all transactions will now show the current state of fees that exist on the blockchain right now. So there will be a coin in which the vote took place last time or actually not the vote but the uh, acceptance of new fees and how much of the fee had been calculated in this amount that was then denominated in relation to the price of BIP. The next new thing is seamless updates. We no more need to stop the chain, export the genesis file, go through with the update and import Genesis back. Previously, it was super slow. Now it'll happen on the fly. Uh, you, implying you are a validator or actually any other node owner, take a vote and transmit the code name of the uh, update, also the public key of a validator on behalf of which you vote, and the height at which you want it to go live. All two thirds of the votes have to be in favor as well. The field version has to match also. After that, since we've already updated, we simply wait for this block number to be reached. We already loaded the new code base, so once the blockchain reaches the specified height, the code base that executes all of the chain's logic will be replaced for the new implementation. Also, it'll be possible to retrieve old blocks as well and streamline the code base replacement uh, depending on the block height. Well, that's it. There will also be a network update event. Thanks a lot for your attention and uh, have a good testing.